So um, just to remind, we're at page 27, and we left off. We were talking about the various steps in a civil lawsuit. And if I think, if I remember correctly, we have been talking about complaint and the answer and pleadings. Um, and I don't think we got to discover yet. So um, just to remind you where we left off, page 49. Uh, pleadings, and just pleadings are the documents that the lawyers file to start a court case. And then the defendant will file an answer, the response to the complaint, to respond to the allegations. And then we have these other types of pleadings that I went through last time that are variations. So for the midterm, fill the blank question, pretty high probability that this will be fill in the blank. So list four types of pleadings. And then I want you to know which side files the pleading, plaintiff or the defendant. And then the two purposes of the pleadings down below here we talked about last time. I think that's where we left off. The first purpose is to set out factual issues. And then the second purpose is to write down for the judge what remedy you are asking for. So let's talk about, yeah. So what page? That's on page 29. Okay, so let's talk about this word remedy. A remedy refers to what outcome you want as a result of a lawsuit. Are you asking for money for your lost profits, for your lost wages, or your out-of-pocket expenses, repair costs, whatever? Or are you asking for some other outcome that does not involve money, like a court order? So for example, maybe I'm suing somebody because they are using my trademark, like the Nike swoosh. And they don't have legal authority to do that. I haven't given them permission. So I'm suing them, and I want the judge to order them to quit using my trademark without my permission. So that would be a non-monetary remedy. So remedies are divided into two basic categories. The first is what we call a legal remedy. This is also known as a remedy at law. Remedy at law. And that essentially is a monetary remedy. That is, you're asking a judge to order somebody to pay you money for some reason. The other type of remedy is called an equitable remedy, or a remedy at equity. And that is a court order of some type. It could be a restraining order, prohibiting somebody from contacting someone, or it could be an order that requires somebody to sell you something under the terms of the contract to complete the sale, or it could be what's called an injunction, that is an order prohibiting somebody from doing something, like in an environmental case, where maybe there's a logging company that's going to cut down trees and it will destroy habitat, and so if I'm a conservation group, I sue and I ask for an injunction, that is a court order to prohibit them from cutting the trees down. So money or non-monetary? Monetary, non-monetary. Money at law, a, a legal remedy is a remedy involving money, and an equitable remedy is a court order. If you know that much, you're good. Now, over on page 32, I have this detailed out a little bit more, way more detailed than you need to know. This is not a fill in the blank question, so 0%. I used to ask this as a fill in the blank, but nobody could ever remember it, so I quit doing it. <laughs> Go to law school, you learn about all this. But these are basically the two broad categories. Don't worry about all these specific terms. I don't test on that anymore. All I want you to know is real simple. Money, no money. Money is a legal remedy. Non-monetary is an equitable remedy. Now, just so you know where this comes from, just from history, in England, there were two types of courts. There were courts of equity, and there were courts of law, a court of law. And you had to decide when you were filing a lawsuit under Old English rules, did you want a court order? And if you did, you had to file in a court of equity. 
If you wanted money, you had to file a court of law. A judge of law could not order an equitable remedy. An equitable judge or a judge in the court of equity could not order a monetary award. So you had to choose. That's why we get these two. Now, in the United States, typically our courts are both combined. So you can ask for both, monetary and non-monetary remedies. There are some exceptions, like small claims court is only a court of law. But the idea being that in your pleadings, that is where you have to identify what you want the judge to order if you win the case. And it could be both. It could be money and a court order prohibiting use of your trademark or whatever. All right? For you guys, I just want you to know the difference. So, for example, best question, um, Bill sues Ted and is asking the judge for a court order prohibiting Ted from using his logo. Is that an equitable remedy or a legal remedy? Court order. Equitable. Right? Non-monetary. Non-monetary. Bill sues Ted because Ted damaged his car and he wants the money it's going to cost to repair the car. Is that a legal remedy or an equitable remedy? Legal. He's asking for money. If you know that much, you're good. Okay? The rest of these, if you go to law school, we'll learn about those. All right. So let's go back to page 27. And let's move on to the next major step in a civil lawsuit, which is called the discovery process. Discovery. Question. On the test, is it just going to be list any floor or the specific floor? Um, these are the main ones I want you to know. You can list anything on this page. I don't care. But the main ones, complaint, C, answer, A, D, discovery, trial, V for verdict, and then finally appeal at the bottom. All right. Those are kind of the main ones I want you to know. But, you know, if you list any of the other ones, I'll give you credit. No problem. All right, so discovery. Major part of the civil litigation process and to some degree the criminal as well. So page 30 is where we're going to go. All right. The, the, this is a list of different methods and tools that we lawyers have in the discovery process. So first of all, what do we mean by discovery? Discovery is the process where the lawyers basically have the opportunity to investigate and to learn about what evidence the other side has that they might use during trial, what witnesses they may have, what documents or photographs or videotapes or electronic evidence, computer records, etc. that the other side has, and also what evidence there may be out there in the world that's not in the possession of the other side to a lawsuit. So like a bank or a hospital that would provide records. So the reason we call it discovery is the idea that the lawyers in a lawsuit have the opportunity to discover what the other side has ahead of time, before you go to trial. So this would be kind of like a comparison um, to football coaches. We've got Super Bowl coming up this weekend. So it would be like the coaches for the Rams and the Patriots exchanging their playbooks before the game. Right? They don't do that. Do something to know about, right? And telling their side, okay, here are the players I'm going to call or have during the game. These are the players I'm going to use, which in the law would be like my witnesses, right? Playbook would be like what evidence I have. Now, we don't have to tell the other coach, okay, I'm going to run these plays, but here's my playbook. I might run the plays in this book. I don't have to tell them all my strategy, but I do have to provide what information I have. Now, in terms of law, in a lawsuit, I would have to provide documents to the other side that we have in our possession. Could be bank records or medical records, photographs, videotapes, whatever, and um, witness lists, that kind of thing. Now, the whole idea behind discovery is so that the lawyers know pretty much <coughs> what the evidence is going to be before you go to trial. And the reason why that's important is it actually helps cases get settled. Because, like, for example, if I know that my client, the evidence is 
basically stacked against them. I'm going to tell my client, hey, you better settle or you're going to kill the trial. And so <coughs> promote settlement if we know ahead of time what evidence there is. So these are various different tools that we have as lawyers to be able to do this investigation and to learn what the other side has uh, as potential evidence in the upcoming trial. So let's start with the first one, a subpoena. A subpoena is an order that is issued by, usually in a, most cases, a lawyer, but it could be issued by a judge, in a grand jury in a criminal case, by Congress, they have subpoena power. So a subpoena power is the power to require, mandate, somebody to show up and testify as a witness, either to trial or to a deposition or to some other kind of legal proceeding of some type, maybe an arbitration or whatever. So I, as an attorney, if I know that there are people I want to come to the trial and be a witness, I can have them serve with a subpoena, and then they have to come in and testify. If they don't, I can ask for the judge to order them in, and the judge may hold them in contempt if they don't show up and actually go out and send the sheriff after them to bring them in. There's another type of subpoena, which is called a subpoena ducis tecum, which I won't test you on. But in the real world, you might see that. And that's a records subpoena. That says records, that is documents, right? So this is an order that a lawyer can send typically to an outside party that's not part of the lawsuit, like a bank or a hospital or an accountant or some third party where I want to get records that they have in their possession. So this is kind of standard practice in a divorce case. We'd send out a subpoena to maybe the bank so we can get two years worth of checking account records. Send a subpoena to, in a personal injury case, to the hospital so we can get medical records. Um, to an accountant to get all their tax records and QuickBook files and all that kind of stuff. Now you can do both. I can subpoena somebody to testify as a witness and bring the records with them. Like a doctor, you have to come in and testify during the, the trial about the surgery and also bring their medical records as part of that. Now, I've had lots of students over the years, had nothing to do with being in a trial or whatever. Um, typically, they work for a bank or a medical facility and they got a subpoena to produce these documents. And then they have to compile up those documents and then there's a little statement they have to sign certifying that they're true and accurate copy of everything in the file. So that's usually a subpoena deuces teaching. Now for you guys, answer a subpoena for a witness or to testify, either one, 100% correct, and a record subpoena. You don't have to say deuces teaching, okay? Just for records, that's fine with me. And again, this is a possible fill in the blank question. List four methods of discovery. Number two, interrogatories. Interrogatories. Oh, um, here I put third party up on subpoena. Usually a subpoena is issued to somebody not part of the lawsuit, but it is possible to subpoena the other side. But usually it's an outside party. So I put third party. Okay, interrogatories, L to L, lawyer to lawyer. So an interrogatory is a set of written questions and answers that the lawyers exchange with each other. And then their client has to answer the written question in writing as well. And their answer constitutes an admission. In some cases it's done under oath, so if you lie it's false swearing or perjury. We don't use a lot of these in Oregon, only in federal court, but in California they're they use them all the time. Most other states use them. Um, so basically a written question that you give to the other lawyer and then their client has to answer it in writing. So it's a very powerful technique. Um, and if you know just written question and answer, that's really all you need to know. All right, number three, request for production, an RFP, request for production of evidence. Again, L to L, lawyer to lawyer. Very, very common. Virtually every lawsuit that gets beyond the initial stages are going to have these. And this is basically a list of things, documents, 
photographs, uh, medical records, whatever, whatever the other side may have in their possession that's relevant to the case, I can ask that the other lawyer provide that to me for inspection and a, a, photo, a copy or whatever. So in other words, I can ask you to give me stuff, documents or whatever. Anything that you have in your possession that's relevant to the case. So that can include everything from bank records, retirement account statements, insurance information, um, physical things like the car from the accident. I actually had a case once where, this is when I worked for the trucking company, we had a semi-truck that was back in Connecticut at the time. And the lawyer gave us a request for production that we had to produce the semi-truck that was in the accident. So we had to have the truck drove from Connecticut back here to Oregon. We met at the rest area up by Wilsonville on I-5. And the other lawyer then had the opportunity to inspect the actual semi-truck and the trailer. So pretty much any physical thing. Again, lawyer to lawyer. Very, very common. All right, number four, request for admission. Now this is really similar to an interrogatory in one way, but it's more narrow. This is essentially, again, lawyer to lawyer, where we send a demand to the other lawyer requiring that their client admit or deny a statement. Admit or deny whether or not something's true. So I may send a request to the other lawyer, like in the case of our insurance, the guy that drowned, this little back pattern we were talking about last week with Anthony Caruso. I could send a request for admission to the insurance company lawyer, admit or deny whether or not Anthony Caruso is dead. Because they denied that in their answer. And then they would write back, we admit that he's dead. We deny that he died accidentally. So what I'm trying to do is narrow down the issues for when we go to trial and get them to admit things that I can use against them if we go to trial. Not super common. Uh, some lawyers use them more than others. I, I like them. I think they're very powerful, but not all that common. Question? How does it apply to like, the pleadings? Or, uh, what, was, what was the example we were said admit, 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 admit. Right. That's like in the answer? Right. So let me show you. The answer. I'll show you exactly. Yeah. So here we go. Here are the pleadings. So they admitted paragraph, oh, I know you can't see that. They admitted paragraph one, two, three, four. They denied five, admitted six, denied seven. So if you look at paragraph five, they denied that. All right? So let me blow that up. So they, they denied that whole sentence. All right? So they denied the date. They're denying that he drowned, they're denying that he died, and of course they're denying accident. So I'm trying to narrow down, I'm going to basically pick that sentence apart. And I'm going to say, okay, you denied all that, so admit or deny that he died, number one. Admit or deny that he died on September 20th, 2012, number two. Admit or deny that he died by drowning. So I can narrow down and pick apart that sentence. That way I know exactly what their argument's going to be through use of those requests. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because they denied that whole thing. Right. Now, the reason why I'm doing that is, one, so I know what their argument's going to be <coughs> in court ahead of time, and number two, so I can narrow down what I have to prove. Because once they admit to it, I don't have to prove it anymore. <clears throat> okay. And then finally, we have what we call depositions. Very common. A deposition is a face-to-face, -face, live, right here, question and answer session, if you will, where a lawyer gets to ask questions of anybody that has relevant information to a case, including the other side and any third-party witnesses that there may be out there in the world. So lawyer to lawyer or third party. So for example, I may um, have somebody that witnessed an automobile accident. They were on the sidewalk. They had nothing to do with the accident other than they saw what happened. So I could bring them in to my office, have them sit down for a deposition. They're sworn under oath. And then I get to ask them questions and they have to answer them. 
Everything that they say is recorded, put down on paper by uh, a court reporter. So oftentimes we'll videotape them as well. And they have to answer under oath. So if they lie, it's either depending on state you're in, false swearing or perjury. And then the reason we do that, of course, is first of all, so we know what somebody's going to say before we go to trial. That way we know what the answers are ahead of time. And then also, if they change their story in trial, then we can go back later and say, okay, during deposition you said the car was red. Today, here at trial, you said the car was blue. So you changed your story. Both times you were under oath. So were you lying then or are you lying now? Basically, I just proved you're a liar, right? That's why we use those. And then part two is also so you can find out how good somebody is going to be as a witness. Some people are not very good witnesses. Some people are great witnesses. And it helps you kind of strategize that way. Now, for you guys, what I want you to know is basically the, big, the, the top number three top three common, subpoena, request for production, and a deposition. Now in the real world, this is where even if you're not involved with a lawsuit as a party, you may be an employee, maybe you're in charge of the human resources department, you might get brought into a deposition to answer questions about somebody's employment file, their wage and hour, uh, their employment records, their training, um, any discipline that they you know, had, things like that. So you have nothing to do with the case, but you're the HR director. So you're going to come into deposition and answer questions, probably go to trial too, as a witness. All right, so the idea again, this way the lawyers hopefully <coughs> will have, essentially, they know about what evidence there is before you ever go to trial. That way there's like no surprises or minimal surprises during the trial itself. List four for the midterm uh, fill the blank question. So, out of those. And I'll tell you right now, uh, just so you know, um, if you don't spell like interrogatory correct, I'm not going to mark you down. Right? I'm, I'm not a big stickler on spelling in this class. Like Deuces Tekin, you guys are going to remember that. Record subpoena, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you spell subpoena without an O, that's okay. In Oregon law, it's actually spelled sometimes with an O, sometimes without, because the legislature wrote that in the statute that way. So don't worry about spelling so much. If you're close, I'll give you full credit. Okay? Um, if you're sort of in the same realm, I'll give you partial credit. All right, so back to page 27. So here we are at the discovery stage. So number six. Discovery motion to compel. Sometimes you have a situation where another lawyer or the, their client is not cooperating with you, not providing you the documents you've asked for, or whatever. And so um, you can file a motion with the court and ask the judge to order the other lawyer and their client to respond to your request for discovery. And then if they don't, you can file a motion with the court to enforce that. And a judge has lots of different options, but one option is to do a monetary penalty against the non-complying side and their attorney, and potentially even jail as contempt. So um, that gives us the ability to go to court if somebody's not cooperating with us and ask a judge to basically put down the hammer and make them cooperate. Not super common, but it does happen. All right, so after discovery, sometimes you'll go in and change the pleadings, maybe change the remedies you're asking for, that kind of thing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, then the case will be set for a trial. You'll have a pretrial conference with the judge, typically, where you'll meet with the judge, the lawyers will at least, talk about the case, and then you go to trial. Now, this really is not a class about trials. Okay, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on what happens in a trial itself. I'm more interested that you know about what happens before the trial. Because in the real world, that's most likely where you would be involved, you know, unless you're a lawyer. A couple things I do want you to know about trial. First of all, 
If you're going to have a jury trial, the first step is you've got to pick the jury. A jury is a group of people, like us, that are brought in to decide either a criminal case or a civil jury trial. And as part of that process, the lawyers and the judge will have the opportunity to ask questions of people that might be on the jury. You know, who are you? How are you employed? What's your educational background? Have you been convicted of any crimes? Have you ever been sued before? Do you know anybody involved in the lawsuit? Uh, do you know any of the attorneys or the judge or anybody else? Um, and then, you know, as lawyers, we can ask people questions. And we also have the ability to have them removed if, one, they cannot be fair, or two, there's something that we don't like, with, with some exceptions. Now, I'm not going to get into that whole process in this class. I just want you to know this kind of cool term, voir dire, voir dire. French verbs see and speak, right? And so this is, gives us the ability to see somebody on, that might be on a jury and hear them speak. That's where that comes from. The process of voir dire. And that whole process may take 10 minutes. It may take a month or two months in a big uh, capital murder case. All right. So after you pick a jury, the, the plaintiff will go first. They put on their case first. They're the plaintiff. They filed the lawsuit, the complaint. The plaintiff has the burden of proof. Burden of proof. So that's another term I want you to know. Oh, what page is that on? Here we go, page 31. Okay, burden of proof. Uh, possible fill in the blank, 50 pitch, not high. But definitely want you to know number one and number three, what they mean. All right, so first let's start with this term, burden of proof. You hear this in the news all the time in John Grisham books and everybody else. And what does that really mean, burden of proof? Burden of proof is, has two parts, two parts to it. The first part, refers to how strong is the evidence that must be presented for you to win the case. How good does your evidence have to be to win? How well do you have to prove your case? And we have three different levels for that. The highest level is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. That is very high standard. That basically means that the jury does not have a reasonable doubt about the correct outcome. And in a criminal case, that means that a jury has to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt or they have to find the person not guilty of the crime. It's a very high standard. I don't really like percentages, but I, I just put up here, we're talking 99% plus. So if you have a reasonable doubt about whether or not somebody's <coughs> guilty, you have to find them not guilty. In other words, the evidence wasn't strong enough, okay? In a criminal case, that will always be the standard. Misdemeanor or felony, doesn't matter. If there's jail time as a possibility, that's the burden that has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Now the idea there is if somebody is subject to potential jail, or even the death penalty if it's an aggravated murder, then the proof must be very strong in order to put someone in jail. Very high standard. Next one down is still a very high standard, but it's lower. And that is proof with clear and convincing evidence. Now this is not real common. We do see this in different kinds of cases. And I don't get into it so much in this class. That's why I don't have it highlighted. But one area where this applies is uh, a mental health <coughs> commitment called a civil commitment. This is where if somebody has not committed a crime, but whatever reason they have mental, physical issues such that they're a danger to themselves, to other people, there's no other reasonable method other than having them, against their will, put into a mental facility like the State Hospital over in Salem, or 48. And so in order to do that, basically you're, it's, it's kind of like incarcerating somebody, right? 
And so the idea is there has to be clear and convincing evidence that one, that person has a situation mentally and physically <coughs> where they're a danger to themselves, than other, their other people, and there's no other reasonable method other than having them committed. Very, it's pretty high standard. Not to the level of beyond a reasonable doubt, but pretty close. So I put 75%, that's probably low. It's probably 80, 85%. Then number three at the bottom here is the lowest standard. And this is really what I want you guys to know. That's why I have it highlighted in a little star by it. This is the burden that applies in 90% of civil lawsuits. So the lawsuit that we're talking about in this class is a breach of contract case, a tort case, negligence, or intentional torts, which we'll talk about later. Um, most kinds of civil lawsuits that you're going to see, this is the burden, including a non-criminal traffic violation. That's the burden in like a traffic, a speeding ticket or whatever, <coughs> where there's only a monetary fine. Proof with a preponderance of the evidence. 50.1%, so much lower standard. So this is basically the, a burden that you have to prove your case better than the other side. Whoever has better evidence wins. You can have doubt, you as the jury, that doesn't matter. You have doubt about who's going to win and who's going to lose. Jury, you pick which side has more evidence than the other, who has better evidence. It's not convincing, it's not beyond a reasonable doubt, it's if you have better evidence than I do, you win, right? So the scale of justice ever so slightly tips one way or the other. Burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, the scale of justice tips heavily. Clear and convincing, not quite as heavy, but pretty heavy. Beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, just a little bit, right, or more. Now, here's what's interesting. Question about it. On your clear and convincing evidence, yeah. how does a case like that normally get filed? Or, or who files? Oh, uh, okay. that can happen in a number of different ways. One, typically it would be police intervention. Um, like somebody was just being real weird and acting out. And um, they, they, it's called a mental, they take it out of a mental hold. Uh, they do custody of a mental hold. And then, uh, then they have to go to court if, they, if there's no other place to put them. Mm -hmm. um, that's usually how it comes in. Sometimes there'll be a family member calling it in. Um, like I had a case once where there was a guy that had uh, basically dropped a bunch of that. I just I took off all his clothes and was howling at the moon and running around naked in the front yard. Yeah, not sort of criminal-ish, yeah. but not to that point, but basically he started you know, running through the bushes and hurt himself and, so mom called the police and they came in and took him in on a metal hole. So that kind of thing. Um, yeah, there are usually other methods other than committing. But, and that can also arise if they do commit a crime and their, their, their sentences are they're deemed they can't go to jail because of their mental situation. Yeah. All right. Part two to a burden of proof. Remember, I said there's two parts. The first is what level? How good is your proof? The second part to burden of proof refers to which side in a case has the obligation to prove their point, to prove the case. Which side has an obligation to produce evidence to prove what they're saying is true? Okay. Now I'm going to make another comparison to sports. And again, I'll use football because we have Super Bowl coming up. So the burden of proof in football, which side, the offense or the defense, has to do something first? The offense or the defense? Yeah, the offense, right? So the quarterback comes up, and if the quarterback just stands there and does nothing, eventually a play clock will expire, you lose the down. You do that four times, you lose the ball, turn over on downs. The defense doesn't have to do anything. They can just stand there and say, okay, you going to do something? you going to hike the ball? If you don't, right? So the burden is on the offense to do something. Same thing, burden of proof. The burden is on the plaintiff. Now, in a criminal case, the burden is with the government. 
That is who brought the criminal case. The charges are brought by a government unit. It always stays with the government. It doesn't shift to the defendant to prove you're not guilty. You are innocent until proven guilty, right? That means the burden is on the government. You don't have to prove you're innocent in a criminal case. It's a little different in civil. Civil, the burden starts with the plaintiff. And then it can shift to the defendant to disprove what the plaintiff said. Then it can shift back and forth, kind of like tennis. Um, in other types of cases, like tax law, the burden is on you to prove you don't owe the tax. So it's like completely the opposite of the criminal side, if it's a civil tax thing. Now, I don't get into that too much. The main thing I want you to know about that point is in a criminal case, the burden is always on the prosecutor to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. If you know that much, you're good. Okay. All right. Another little interesting thing here, criminal, civil, okay? We're gonna talk about this a little bit more later on tonight, but just for right now. Criminal law and civil law are two different types of law. We talked about that already, but they intersect with each other. Now what I mean by that is a person can do something that constitutes a crime, and also they can be sued for it in civil court for the very same thing. So like, um, let's say I kill somebody, murder. That's a crime. I can also then be sued by the family for wrongful death in a civil court. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Sometimes you'll have a situation where somebody's charged with a crime, they go to trial, and they're found not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. They're found not guilty of the crime, higher level. And then they are sued in civil court by the family. And they're found liable for wrongful death, which is the civil side. It's called a tort of causing somebody's death. Not guilty criminal, but liable civil because it's a lower standard. Right? Who am I talking about? Who's found not guilty of murder, but then sued by the family and found liable? And he drove a white Bronco. Los Angeles. O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson. <coughs> not guilty of murder, was sued by the families and found liable for what's called wrongful death. Flip side, if you're found guilty of a crime, essentially you're automatically at fault for the civil side because it's a higher standard. All right. So back to page 27. So again, I'm just going to get through the trial here fairly quickly because I, I don't have a lot of that on the test, and that's a different class. So the plaintiff goes first. They put on their evidence. They call their witnesses and all that. They have the burden of proof. They then rest their case. The judge then makes a decision if they prove their case well enough. If not, the judge may throw it out. It's called a directed verdict. Don't worry about that. At that point, the defendant would put on their case. And and then there's a chance for the plaintiff to come back and do what's called rebuttal. After both sides have put on their case, then the lawyers will do closing arguments to the jury and basically try to convince the jury which side should win, try to convince you, you know, why, why I should win and not them. The judge will then instruct the jury about what the law is. And at that point, the jury will leave the room and they'll deliberate in a different room. And then assuming they can agree, they will reach a verdict. So I had this highlighted, and I want you to know that word, verdict. Verdict. A verdict is a decision by a jury. Decision by a jury. And then at that point, the loser has the opportunity to appeal the decision if they want to. Most cases are not appealed, but if they do appeal, there's essentially three outcomes, kind of like sports. So the first is the decision is agreed, affirmed on appeal. That is, the Court of Appeals agreed with the outcome of the trial, the decisions that were made by the judge, and they, the ruling on the field is confirmed, right? So I put it. Or, no, something happened during the trial that was wrong, Therefore, they overturn the outcome, reversed. The decision on the field is overturned. It's actually 
actually a first step. Or a remand, that is do over. Send it back and do it all over again. We're going to remand it back for a new trial. So agree, disagree, do over, basically. Affirm, reverse, remand. Now there are some in between things, but that's beyond this class. Okay, covered a lot there, I know. What do you need to know? First of all, possible fill in the blank. What are four steps in a civil lawsuit? And then just pick whatever you want. Page 27, correct. The other kind of question I'll ask is, okay, I'll take CAD, TVA. Complaint, answer, discovery, trial, verdict, appeal. Those are the big ones. And I'll mix them up. You gotta put them in correct order. Oh. CAD, TVA. Okay, I got you, okay. CAD, TV, A. Period, design, Tennessee Valley Authority. You come up some. Right? Now, here's how you get that one. Complaint's always first, right? Because you can't have a lawsuit without a complaint. That starts it. Verdict is always going to be at the end, and the appeal is always going to be at the very bottom. So, complaint, then you get an answer, then you do discovery, then you have a trial, so you guys can remember that. CAD, TVA. So, I'm not going to ask you about the all that. Okay. Oh, by the way, next week, um, We'll do a review for the midterm, and I'll go through all the different pages that are likely to be filled with blank questions. What's the midterm? Midterm is uh, the 13th of February, so not next week, but the following week. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, I got to backtrack a little bit here. Let's go to page 43. We're going to switch gears. Now let's go ahead and let's restart.